So I want to tell you a story about Nelson. Now, Nelson didn't grow up too different than a lot of kids that grow up in poverty in a large city. When he got to college, he was actually expelled from school. And when he returned home, his, his adoptive father, because his biological father had passed away, thought he would deal with this by arranging a marriage for Nelson, right? We're going to get this kid straightened out. Nelson didn't like this idea, so he ran away. He was homeless for a period of time, and he completed a university course through correspondence. Nelson's future didn't look terribly bright in his early to mid-20s, and we wouldn't think that he was going to be particularly resilient or particularly successful. But what Nelson did was surprise all of us because he became a paradigm of resilience. He was able to change the lives of millions of people across the world and in South Africa. And when we think about fortitude and resilience and being tested in life, I think Nelson Mandela is one of those names that comes to mind. So how did Nelson Mandela move from being this person who had a troubled childhood, who didn't have a particularly bright future, to being one of the most preeminent resilient leaders that we think about? If you study leadership and these behaviors, what we come to are five practices that we can cultivate to expand resilience. And so why is resilience important? Why is it important for you? Why is it important for your leaders? Why is it important for your organization? We live in a world that has an increasingly complicated, fast-paced, and difficult context. We talk a lot about the VUCA environment. We talk about global roles, 24-7 technology. I don't know about you, but when I wake up in the morning, I've already got 50 emails from my inbox, right? Because Asia Pac and Europe have already started working. We've got mergers and acquisitions. The very fabric of our organizations is shifting under our feet. Add on restructuring, reorganization, change in the context of our organizations. And then my favorite, ambiguity. And if you can read the little words here, it says, what happens in vagueness stays in vagueness. <laughs> See what they did there? Yeah, I like it too. So we've got this context that becomes increasingly exhausting, where we need to cultivate leadership that is sustainable, and relevant. And so first what I want to talk to you a little bit about is what resilience is not. So I wrote an article for the Human Capital Institute not too long ago called Resilience is Not Bouncing Back. We use that language a lot. Resilience is about being able to engage in a challenge and to allow yourself to be fundamentally changed by that experience. So I think if we asked Chris or we asked Debbie, did you bounce back to who you were before? I think they would say no. Debbie's shaking her head no. You become a different person. You change shape and form, and you have the opportunity to grow and enhance your capacity. The second thing that resilience is not is it's not about passively allowing time to change or heal things, right? We've heard kind of this phrase, time heals all wounds. I think it's more like Andy Warhol says, which is time changes things, but you have to exert the influence and the intention and the focus, as Chris talked about, to change them yourself. So what is resilience? Well, if adversity is the trip we take, resilience paves the road for us. And it's the willingness to engage with that challenge positive or negative, right, depending on how we categorize it, and as a result, allow ourselves to be fundamentally changed. And in exchange, we receive the gifts of enhanced confidence, strength, wisdom, and courage. So I want to talk to you about the five practices of particularly resilient people. What are these things that emerged in our qualitative interviews so you can think about these constructs and how you might want to enhance or apply them within each of your organizations as it fits for you. So the first one is this concept of vulnerability. 
I don't know about you, but I'm sort of like the most invulnerable, vulnerable person I know. I love the idea of vulnerability. It makes me terribly uncomfortable. This quote from Brene Brown, what makes you vulnerable makes you beautiful. I'm working on believing that. But what we find when we interview our leaders is the people that can bring their whole selves forward, right? To integrate themselves holistically, to not hold back parts and pieces of themselves are the ones that are the most resilient because they're not expending energy trying to only put part of themselves forward and keep other aspects of themselves back. They're bringing forward everything about who they are to a particular task or opportunity or challenge or deliverable. And so the idea of vulnerability here as it pertains to resilience is this opportunity to integrate yourself holistically and then to bring your whole self into the light to allow your internal self, your thoughts, your feelings, your experiences to match your external self and how you or the leaders within your organization show up. Now there's a little thing that gets in the way for people with vulnerability, and this is something that we discovered is called the shame bias. The shame bias is the idea that if you tell me you've overcome a challenge, I think you're a hero. I think you are incredible in your fortitude and what you faced. But if I think about telling you some of my own challenges, I think you're going to think less of me. Because what that shame bias says is while I don't think it's your fault for what happened to you, I'm afraid that I might be responsible for the adversity that I faced. And so this keeps people from bringing these experiences into the light from allowing people's whole selves to shine forth. Yet, these are incredibly important experiences that shape us, our organizations, and our leaders. The second practice of particularly resilient people is this idea of productive perseverance. So we've all gotten conflicting information, stay the course or shift gears. And so what we find is that leaders are able to navigate this polarity of whether or not they should follow this contradictory advice. When do they pivot and when do they maintain the mission? A great example of productive perseverance is this woman here, Anne Mulcahy. Does anyone know who Anne Mulcahy is? One in the audience? So Anne is the current CEO of Xerox, but she wasn't always the CEO of Xerox. She started in the sales field in 1976, very male-dominated, selling Xerox machines. And after six years, she asked repeatedly to be promoted to a manager. She was consistently passed over until she took what she called a loser territory in Maine. She turned that territory around over the course of two years and asked to receive the next promotion. And what do you think happened? She didn't receive it. So Anne had this choice, right? Should she pack up and go to another organization? Should she do something different? Or should she persevere and stay the course, despite the fact that she was frustrated and didn't feel recognized? Well, Anne stayed the course at Xerox, and of course she's become the current CEO of the organization. But without adeptly knowing whether or not she should persevere in that situation, she might not have become their CEO. And so the idea here is that if we can help our leaders know when and how to stay the course, even when it's difficult, not only can we retain and engage some really stellar future senior leaders for the organization, it also, in the case of women and diversity, can help promote inclusion within the organizations where we work. <clears throat> 